When we discuss a psychological theory, it's usually assumed that it applies to everyone. But when we look a little closer at the reality of who created these theories and who the participants were in the studies, we use it evidence for these theories, things get a little, well, problematic. It turns out that the vast majority of theories that form accepted psychological theory, the stuff we teach in universities, well, those theories were created by white males. And it's very likely that many of these theories have been influenced or biased by their unique perspective. And those participants in the studies? Well, it turns out that they're weird. By that, I mean they're mostly Western, highly educated, from industrialized nations, richer than most, and from democratic societies. So, not like the vast majority of the world's people. So, let's look a little deeper at two particular sources of bias in psychology, gender and culture bias. The PsychBoost flashcard app has a new feature. Test yourself with over 1,500 multiple choice questions, including every topic on A-level and GCSE psychology. Try paper one for free right now. And Patreon supporters can watch PsychBoost videos ad-free, learn from over 17 hours of exclusive exam tutorial videos, and access hundreds of digital and printable resources, including mind maps, quiz sheets, worksheets, teaching slides, and more. Universality and bias. Before I start, you'll notice that I use lots of examples from other parts of psychology in this Issues and Debates unit. In part, I'm doing this to help put these complex ideas into context, but also because the Issues and Debates make excellent evaluations for other parts of your course. And another reason is often in the Issues and Debates section of your exam, you're asked to talk about these ideas in the context of other topics. I can't include every possible link, so perhaps as you watch these videos, consider what other parts of the specification I could have mentioned. Back to bias. We would say psychologists are biased if they allow their pre-existing views of the world influence the theories they construct and how they interpret the data they collect. These assumptions come from the psychologist's personal experience, including the culture they grew up in, their educational background, political viewpoints, and their experience of living as a certain gender in their society. Ultimately, the problem with bias is it leads to an invalid understanding of human behavior, one that's based on the perspective and misconceptions of the researcher rather than on objective data. There are, of course, many types of potential bias, but in this video, we need to focus on gender bias and culture bias. Gender bias is when researchers' stereotypical beliefs about male and female behavior influence their theoretical assumptions. This is a problem as it can misrepresent actual male and female behavior either by assuming behavior is different, depending on gender when it's actually similar, or that behavior is identical when it's quite different. Cultural bias in the context of psychology means interpreting and judging human behavior through the lens of your own cultural expectations and norms. This misrepresentation is often due to the researchers having an ethnocentric viewpoint. They automatically assume their own culture is superior to other cultures, or the norm that other cultures should be judged against. One word I want to make clear before we discuss each type of bias in more detail is universality. Universality applied to psychology is the argument that observed behavior is true of all humans, despite differences like gender, biology, or cultural upbringing. When psychologists make a discovery, they're likely to claim, or it's automatically assumed, that the behavior they've observed is true of all humans. They're claiming universality. But while it might be true of the sample in this study, if they haven't tested their hypothesis with a truly diverse sample, then this is just an assumption, one that might not be generalizable. Unfortunately, the samples used in psychological research are famously weird. This means they're mostly Western, educated, from industrialized societies, rich, and live in democratic societies. The vast majority of the 8 billion or so people in the world are not weird but much of the currently accepted psychological research has been conducted in the Western world, especially in the USA and the UK. And to make it worse, most samples are opportunity samples, making the majority of participants in psychology studies Western psychology students, hardly representative of all of humanity. If our understanding of human psychology is based on this limited sample, and other groups' behavior varies from this standard, and their behavior will be defined as abnormal. This is problematic if we want to claim psychology's findings on, say, social influence, memory, attachment, and psychopathology are truly universal. Gender bias. Psychologists and psychological theories that are gender biased are typically androcentric. 
This means they're shaped by and support a male perspective on the world. We tend to find theories androcentric, because historically, the psychologists creating these theories were male. Looking at the specification for this course, we can see a large number of males named, while only four females. Research is gender biased when researchers automatically assume male and female behavior is different or the same. So this means we have two issues, formerly known as alpha and beta bias. Assuming behavior is very different between genders is called alpha bias. In other words, there's been an overemphasis or an exaggeration of behavioral differences between males and females. The most obvious example of alpha bias that you've likely already studied is in the attachment unit. Bowlby's monotrophic theory argues the role of the mother is far more critical than the role of the father in an infant's development. The social norms of 1950s Britain likely shaped Bowlby's ideas. At this time, women were less likely to have independent careers, and parents were less likely to share child rearing. This is an issue as Bowlby's theories may lead to male single parent and single gender families feeling they can't provide the same level of care as traditional family structures. Another example of potential alpha bias is from the relationship unit. Evolutionary theory argues males and females have different sexual behaviors on the basis of their biology. Throughout evolutionary history, males could potentially have many children, but never be entirely sure they were the father of any individual child. Females are completely certain that they're the mothers of their children, but they can only have a limited number of children over a lifetime. It's argued, due to these biological differences, that males, including modern males, are innately promiscuous, trying to impregnate as many women as possible to maximize their chances of passing on their genes, as well as jealously guarding women to reduce the chances they'll have a child with someone else. The same argument suggests women will focus on finding a man with lots of resources who will stick around to help raise their children. So, the problem here is the evolutionary explanation for male and female sexual behavior reinforces a gender double standard. Legitimizing male sexuality is natural, while shaming women for the same behavior. Beta bias is the assumption that there's no difference in the behavior of males and females, potentially underestimating or minimizing behavioral differences. Often historical research used all male samples and assumed the findings would also apply equally to females. We can use two examples from social influence to explain beta bias. In Milgram's original research, all 40 participants were male. Milgram also only studied obedience to male authority figures, ignoring the possibility that people might respond differently to female authority figures. Ash also only used male participants in his study on conformity. In both cases, the choice to use male-only samples was partly due to society's norms at the time, and partly due to a belief in scientific circles that male subjects would provide more generalizable results. Another example of beta bias comes from biological psychology, the fight or flight response. This idea is when presented with a threat like a predator, the automatic response is to fight for your life or run away. But this is based on a male survival strategy and the evidence collected to support the fight or flight response has been primarily conducted on human males. And even when it comes to testing on animals, Researchers used male rats. Taylor argues for females, fighting or running are less effective survival strategies as they're often responsible for caring for small children. Instead, it's argued a female survival response to a stressor is to tend and befriend. Tend is to take actions that maximize the survival of both them and their children, such as getting the child to be quiet so they blend into the environment and befriend is reducing risk by building social connections that can be called on in an emergency situation. Cultural bias. Cultural bias in the context of psychology means interpreting and judging human behavior through the lens of your own cultural expectations and norms. Much of current psychological theory has been conducted by, and on, people from a Western background. I've already told you about weird participants. This term comes from Henrik, let me give you some more detailed numbers from his study. In a sample of hundreds of studies from leading psychology journals, 68% of research subjects came just from the United States, and 96% from Western industrialized nations. When looking closer at the American subjects, 67% were undergraduates studying psychology. 
What this means is a randomly selected American university student is 4,000 times more likely to be a subject in a psychology study than a random non-Westerner. Clearly, this is a problem if we want to claim psychological research reveals universal behaviour. For example, when we use tests created for and by people from very different cultures, cultural bias can affect how we diagnose individuals with disorders. In the UK and the West Indies, the rate of schizophrenia is around 1%. However, people from the West Indies living in the UK are nine times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Fernando argues this is due to a category failure, with Western definitions of mental health being used on non-Westerners. For example, in the West Indies, claiming to hear the voices of angels is a fairly normal religious experience. Whereas in the UK, it's likely to be seen as an auditory hallucination. Ethnocentrism in the context of psychology is when researchers view their own culture or ethnic group as superior to others, and the standard against which other cultures should be judged. As ethnocentric individuals often see their cultural norms as the correct way of living, they may have difficulty understanding or accepting cultural practices that differ from their own. An example of ethnocentrism from your studies is Mary Ainsworth's work on attachment theory. The strange situation could be a culture-bound test, which means that as it was developed within the American cultural context, it may not be appropriate to apply it to child-rearing in other cultures, as there's a potential for misinterpretation. It's essential to recognise that different cultures might have unique child-rearing practices, or values that could influence the infant's behaviour. Labelling these children as insecure is an example of ethnocentrism. In the strange situation, secure attachment is argued to be the best type, but it's far more common in individualistic Western cultures. With 75% of the British sample, and as low as 50% in the Chinese, German infants were more likely to be insecure avoidant, and Japanese infants were more likely to be insecure resistant. We can use the term imposed etic here. This is when we claim a researchers argued their cultural norms should be the standard for all cultures. Cultural relativism is a principle that human behaviour can only be properly understood in the cultural context in which the behaviour happens. This understanding would include the norms, values and beliefs of that culture. Cultural relativism assumes a behaviour that's considered normal, moral or abnormal in one culture might not be viewed the same way in a different culture. I want to make it clear that cultural relativism in psychology does not mean that all practices or beliefs are equally valid or even beneficial from a psychological standpoint. Instead, it's about understanding and respecting cultural differences, but we can still critically discuss human rights and well-being across cultural boundaries. Dealing with bias in psychology now we have a good idea of what gender and culture bias is in psychology, it would be helpful to finish by discussing how we could reduce bias. As in so many issues in life, the first thing to do is admit there's a problem. So to reduce bias when constructing theory, it's important not to automatically assume universal norms or differences across cultures or between both sexes, but instead base any claim of universality or difference on the data. The dominance of one cultural or gendered perspective in psychological theory can be addressed by equal representation of researchers, either by encouraging more female researchers or by promoting indigenous psychology. This is the use of researchers who are native to, or very familiar with, the culture that's being investigated. To make psychology a little less weird, diverse samples are important. Rather than accepting research findings from a single culture as universal, if possible, research should be cross-cultural, or findings in one culture should be compared to replications across multiple cultures, such as Van Eijendorn's meta-analysis of the strange situation. Taking a reflexive approach in dealing with gender and culture bias in psychology means the researcher actively reflecting on their own beliefs, values, and experiences. This self-awareness helps in understanding how these personal factors may influence the research process such as stereotypes that might influence the interpretation of participant behaviour, and how methods may need to be adapted to make them more culturally relevant. When it comes to eventually reporting findings, it's important to make it clear that any theories, findings and conclusions relate only to the gender or culture included in the sample. This should help reduce the chance of other researchers or the media being misled. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. 
I do have extra resources that are exclusive for my patrons. So if you've decided to sign up, you can grab those over on my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos. Of course, including questions on the issues and debates unit. I hope this was helpful and I will see you in the next Psych Boost video.